Welcome, listeners, to www.ironradio.org, the website and podcast for all things strength sports and sports nutrition. Thanks for listening. Good morning, everybody. You are on another episode of Iron Radio. This is Phil Stevens. I am a strength coach, powerlifter, Highland Games athlete, and youth sport coach. Hello, everyone. This is Coach Darrell out of Strength Guild in KC. I am a weightlifting coach, gym owner, and that's about it this week. And this is Lonnie Lowry. I was a former competitive bodybuilder for, 20, I don't know, 20, 25 years. Didn't compete that often, but, and then a professor for about the same amount of time. And now I'm just working on a few books and adjunct teaching and stuff like that. Um, so today, just the science news coming at you here. This first one, I'm interested to get a commentary from uh, both you guys, because the title is New Research on Strength Training and Muscle Building. Well, obviously that caught my attention. This is something that I usually have to go looking for and it was just presented to me. Now these science writers, these science journalists, they're not strength coaches like you guys. They're not an exercise physiologist like me. So they're summing things up in a real top line kind of way. But this is Savannah Logan wrote this for Science Daily, I believe. Strength and Muscle Sport News. It says, new research published in the journal Sports Medicine has shown that uh, pushing yourself to failure in strength training will likely improve your muscle mass, but may not impact your muscle strength. So this is the old adage, you know, I think a lot of power lifters almost roll their eyes at bodybuilders, like exhausting the hell out of themselves, you know, mm -hmm. two more, bro. And whereas, you know, Rob Fortney and I used to have conversations all the time about you got to leave two reps in the tank. You know, mm -hmm. you should walk out of the gym. He would even say almost refreshed or energized. And I'm like, man, that's not how bodybuilders think. And Rob mm -hmm. knew that. I mean, he was a bodybuilder. Anyway, it says in the study, data from 55 earlier studies were uh, looked at in a meta-analysis. They were looking for the relationship between muscle strength, size, and then failure uh, during sets of strength training. The researchers estimated the number of reps in reserve for these athletes. So again, back to that idea like Rob and I were talking about, leave two in the tank, like don't train to failure. They ran statistical analyses to determine how this number was related to their gains, right? Gains in strength versus gains in size. The results show that closely approaching failure during strength training, and in this situation, I think they should probably just say weight training, but uh, does not have a clear impact on strength gains. Uh, it says those who stop far from failure have similar gains to those who approach failure, again, for strength. However, approaching failure during training did seem to result in greater muscle growth. And then I didn't read this whole paper. I didn't pull the whole paper, but the authors stated, let's see here, training closer to failure can increase the accuracy of an athlete's estimate of their number of reps in reserve. More accurate estimates of this number can help athletes choose the heaviest weights possible, which could lead to both gains in mass and strength. If in doubt, Aiming to approach failure during training is likely to be your best option for improving both strength and power. What do you think about that? Does that make sense to you? Is that just stuff we already knew, powerlifting versus bodybuilding? Or I saw, so I saw that one, then I saw a meta analysis maybe last week sometime that was just about essentially lower reps versus higher lower reps, higher sets versus lower sets, higher reps. And that like the muscle gains being similar, but strength gains being better on the lower reps, higher sets group. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I think that's kind of more of the, because I think strength or like, like getting stronger involves velocity to a degree. And so when you train like closer to failure, you kind of train your, like those last, you know, whatever, one or two reps are just slow. You mm -hmm. kind of train yourself to like be slower. Yeah. I agree. And that's like with, for any of my athletes, that's why from day one, well, not day one, because at the very beginning, it's just making them competent in lifting. But once they're competent in lifting, I try to enforce that, like, we're trying to move this bar explosively with the purpose of, like, I know that's going to cut reps off if they're being explosive. Mm -hmm. So. Like if I were to load up a bar with, I don't know, 315 or something, then I went in there and squatted and I just, my plan was to get as many reps as I could. I would purposely conserve my energy. 
and just do enough to get the rep done. Right. Whereas if I go in there with the purpose of just crushing that bar, I'm going to get considerably less reps, but the quality of work I get done for strength gains is, is considerably better. Um, and that's a hard one to get across to people because they, their idea in their heads is generally the opposite. Well, if I do more reps, it's better for me. You know, it's like, not necessarily. Let's look at the value of each rep. So, right. I don't know if I'm using the sense. right terminology here, but that seems to me like the concept of maximum dynamic effort, right? Yeah. It's not a max one rep max. It's max dynamic effort, which means you mm. dump as much electricity down your wires as you can in every set. Or every and it's rep. trainable. Yeah, and it, it's a trainable thing. And that's like, well, that's kind of the whole premise behind dynamic effort days in Westside. And that's definitely, I lean more towards Ed Cohn's line of thinking because, like, there was an interview where they questioned him about speed work. He's like, I didn't do dedicated speed work. I always did speed work. Like, every training day for him, he was trying to move the bar quickly. And uh, once I adopted that style, even on my warm-ups, you know, where – you're just blowing it up. I mean, you, you, everything seemed to go better. Uh, right. You're training to be fast at all times and explosive. And hell, that's one thing for even for older populations. Once you can do it safely, that's one of the things we lose is just speed. <laughs> Being dynamic is one mm -hmm. thing that goes away. And part of that's just joints being worn out and things like that. But the Louis thing too is just like, yeah, the weight is moving slow when you have a max effort, but it's like no one's trying to move the weight slow. You know, like you're you're still trying to like explode through your max effort weights. It's just like the weight is heavy enough that it slows you down. So like the idea and and I think in strength in general, like the like just muscle in general is like secondary to essentially how you're moving the weight in most circles. I wouldn't say in all circles, but like just a lot of times if you're going to, if I wanted to get you just crazy strong and like minimize the amount of muscle mass, we just do like singles all the time, mm -hmm. singles and doubles and that'd be it. So now, I mean, obviously we know like you've got to, you're going to have to put on a certain amount of muscle to move, you know, mm -hmm. enough weight in something. But the idea that the harder, the harder your set is, the more strength you're going to gain is, that's like inverse thinking in mm -hmm. the strength world. Yeah. And like you said, I mean, my goal with, with my athletes is like most of the time, if they walk out of a session, if, and they're not beat up, I'm okay with that it, because essentially what we're always trying to do is, well, number one thing, like if we can, if I have an athlete, like it's their first day and you know, I test them out and then like number one question is tell me how sore you are after it the next day or whatever. And if they're wrecked, and if I can get them to the point where we can do the same work and there is no bad byproduct like that, we're making progress. You know, we're able to do more or the same amount, the same amount that wrecked you or more and not be wrecked. Well, that's a good thing. You know, that's a sign of progress. So mm -hmm. it's not a bad thing to walk out of the gym and be like, Oh man, I got more, uh, especially for a strength, strength athlete. I mean, you can't just be in this state of just beat to hell all the time. Now, we, do we purposely reach for that at times? Yes. Like when we're peeking out from meets and things like that, especially in powerlifting, all my athletes, especially the first times in it, we're, we're a couple weeks out. They're like, man, I feel like crap. I was like, okay, good. You're right where we need you. <laughs> and, and then we're going to back off and you're going to feel good. This, yeah, it's definitely not the goal just to be wrecked all the time. So. Right. Wasn't it Charles Daly used to talk about like he didn't like the term work out because it sounds like exhausted, like you're worked yeah. out. There's nothing left. But in truth, when I look at this study, like practical application. Yeah, like you're saying, even powerlifters, you might do your let's say you do like five sets of five. I don't know, whatever. And then you might do a burnout set and bodybuilders mm -hmm. do that, too. Like, let's cut the weight off the bar and just fry yeah. ourselves on the last set. So you're kind of doing both. Yes. You know, you're leaving some in the tank and then you're doing a burnout set. And I know people all train differently and that kind of stuff, but I didn't really read all of this and I'm tired this morning, you guys. <laughs> but <laughs> like failure at what percent? Kind of this goes back to what you were saying a little bit. Like, is this failure with 90% load? You know, yeah. so you're getting like four reps or is this failure 
with, like you said, 315, where you might be able to do 20 or 30 reps. I mean, if yeah. you're fairly elite. I'm, Stu Phillips group up in Canada, they did some stuff. I'm pretty sure it was those guys years ago that even like a 30% load, they were doing like 20 something reps and they mm -hmm. were really maxing out like muscle protein synthesis. And if you're not careful, I think you'd come to the conclusion that, oh, I can train like that, max out my muscle protein synthesis like acutely, and I'm going to be just as big and strong, or, or at least just as big as somebody who lifts heavier. But I think in the real world, that probably doesn't pan out. I could be wrong, but no, just the bodybuilder yeah. in me is like, you can't, even if the lab equipment says maxed out muscle protein synthesis, yeah, but um, for a burnout set, fine, but at some point, like this study is trying to segregate stronger from bigger. But yeah. if you get stronger and stronger, stronger, the side effect is going to be bigger and bigger and bigger. Yeah. To, I mean, yeah. To, to a point, right? To a point. Well, for sure. And then on that topic as well, it's like people look at studies like that and they misconstrue it. Like if I take an elite athlete and have them do 30 or 40% for high rep sets, it's not the same as somebody that's new. It's a lot of weight. Yes. Like if I take an 800 pound squatter and I have them do 30% for sets, well, yeah, they're going to get work in. But if I take mm -hmm. a kid that's like, he can squat a hundred pounds and I have him do 30, like we're not doing anything. You know? Yeah. Right. <laughs> there, right. There's a big difference in that. And that's the same thing. Like I've, anybody that I've worked with in like that aspires to be a bodybuilder, it's like, well, that's fine. We need to get stronger. Like, if we can get you doing sets of 10 with, you know, 315, that's a big difference. Right. Know? So the, just the potential for progress and growth is there. Well, the biggest, densest bodybuilders were always the heavy lifters. Uh, yeah. Dorian Yates, Mike Francois, Ronnie Coleman, right? These guys were brutally heavy lifters. And they were also the biggest and the hardest in a lot of ways. They didn't yeah. uh, futz around with others. I don't know. Anyway, yeah, I just thought it was interesting there because it, it is, uh, and Gerald, you said you were looking at something that was interesting too about the number of sets versus the number of reps, uh, total dose being the same, right? But sets versus reps. It's neat to look at these meta analyses because the literature didn't used to be like this, right? When we were kids, there weren't tons of meta analyses or umbrella studies. There were individual studies to talk about, but these are studies of many other studies. So now they're only as good as the studies they're based on. That's a limitation of a meta-analysis, you know. But yeah, you can start making training decisions with some of this a little bit better, right? I always used to say in class, one study isn't going to change your practice, you know, with a client or a patient. But these are getting closer to that, right? Uh, what happens when AI starts summarizing these umbrella analyses of the meta-analyses of the individual studies? Like the conclusions are going to be stuff that you can bank on a little bit better. Anyway, it, I, I just thought it was interesting. Okay, I have one more, and this will set us up for the topic of the day if we talk about the Olympics here. This is from Dave Fryers, one of our super listeners here. And when, by the way, when I say that, I don't mean like donor. He's just a, a scientist that I appreciate him sending good stuff. British cyclist doping case raises questions over testing precision. So uh, this is from Julia Robertson or Robinson, uh, July of this year. It says in the summer of 2023, British cyclist Lizzie Banks. And here we go. That my first thought was cyclist. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. everybody shits on powerlifters and bodybuilders. Mm -hmm. but It's the cyclists that are usually in the news. It feels like British cyclist Lizzie Banks faced every professional athlete's worst nightmare. She was notified by UK anti-doping that she had returned an adverse analytical finding, an AAF, a positive test. They identified two substances in her samples, the asthma medication for Moderol, I think, uh, and a diuretic, Clortalidone. So again, uh, asthma med and a diuretic. Now, already a sidebar, I remember reading years ago that something like 20 or 30 percent of olympic athletes are reportedly asthmatic and i'm like come on mm -hmm. like the gen pop is not that high <laughs> that is not the percentage of a gen pop that is like why would athletes why would sporting events select for asthmatic people 
Yeah. Or, or is it more likely that they're on asthma meds because it makes them stronger and or bigger in some <laughs> way? Uh, you know, they're adrenaline like compounds in a lot of ways, you know, uh, beta agonist mm -hmm. and stuff. Banks was told that she may have committed an anti doping rule violation for which she could face a two year ban from cycling. I just couldn't believe it. This is a quote. There was this massive, bold, red highlighted writing, and I just couldn't comprehend what I was seeing before my eyes. Banks told Radio 4's Woman's Hour. I'd been so, so careful throughout my career. I just had no idea how this could possibly have occurred. And then it goes on, and this is irritating, I admit. Guilty until innocent. David Cowan, a world expert on drug detection who led the anti-doping lab for the London, London 2012 Olympics, explains that with suspected doping, athletes are deemed guilty until they are proven innocent. So this is like the opposite, right, of a mm -hmm. legal system. And it just talks about the liability principle and a lot of this stuff. And boy, Dave sent me a book. But essentially, these laboratories, they have more and more sensitive detection limits. And my understanding is they have committees that try to decide what level in the blood is enough to affect performance, I think. But it does bring up the question that if these techniques like chromatography and mass spec and all the stuff they use, if the tech technology is getting better and better, then you can detect like if I had Mexican meat from a couple of months ago and it was raised on some clenbuterol, now I'm popped, mm -hmm. you know, or when I was a sports nutritionist uh, at a D1 school, they would give collegiate series. I think it was EAS. I don't know if you, Phil, you remember that or mm -hmm. drill you remember. I think it was some of the companies like EAS had this collegiate series with the claim being free of something that you might get popped for, like yeah. accidental contamination. So uh, other meds that you're on, other foods, all this kind of stuff kind of comes into play. And then they're talking about how they're trying to untangle this web of exposure. And, you know, there's mention in this piece on hair analysis. I mean, there's urine, hair. What are they going to start taking biopsies? It's crazy. Um, I am old enough that I'm just getting sick of it. I'm almost starting to say, you know what, maybe the – the doping Olympics that we've been talking about is just a mm. easier one where you're actually measuring the health of the athlete and you're not looking for tiny nanogram or picogram amounts of something in their serum that may or may not have made a difference, I guess, yeah. you know, in their performance. What are your thoughts on this? What do you think, Phil? Just in general on, uh, I agree. I mean, I think it's time. I think that games coming up is going to be a big eye opener. And, you know, we're at the point now, you look at our own water supply, you know, it's loaded with crap. <laughs> you know? yeah, and water. what are the chances that, like, how many freaking, you know, birth control pills have been dumped down a toilet and everything else? And, you know, like, it's so easy to get a test, but I mean, to not pass because of something, that's not saying these, like, most of the people getting popped are getting popped for good reason. And that's the other thing that the, the average population just needs to at some point they need to grasp is that elite athletes, they're going to do whatever it takes to win. You know, <laughs> and I'm, I'm going to be really interested in this games. It's like finally seeing them just like, let's uncork these guys and let's follow their health, make sure they're healthy instead of drugged. And let's see what we're capable of. I mean, in every other field in the world, we use technology to advance it so uh it, i'm all for it but yeah i mean it's just the olympic games going on right now and stuff it's just a fallacy that that people think this is a clean sport clean sports in general like they're gonna we've we talked about it numerous times over the last 15 years on the show the athletes and their coaches are always ahead of the drugs or the test there's new drugs yeah. coming out all the time you're never going to stop it. So we might as well at least have an avenue. And that's one thing I like about powerlifting. At least there's an avenue for both. Mm -hmm. And if you have that, if there's an avenue for both, I think the, the, the tested side will be more clean. There is because then there's an avenue for the people that are willing to take it. Like in powerlifting, you're just an asshole. If you enter the, the tested fed. Right. And like, like in the other sports, it's like, there is no te non-tested 
fed. So, I mean, I love this sport. I want to do it. And they, so they do it. You know? So at least if there's both, there's, you can do it. But I have a, I guess uh, not to derail it, but a question for both of you really. Cause so what's the stigma that comes with, you know, I would just say insight, like internal technology, steroids, PDs, et cetera, versus external, because no one seems to have that big a problem with like external tech. Like if you watch the, like the shooters and their little get ups, like they're wearing these full body suits that like mm-hmm. minimize the amount of movement or whatever. You know, I mean, obviously that's like one of the bigger stories from mm-hmm. is like everybody has all these little, you know, gadgets and then there's a dude who's a hundred percent raw. Yeah. <laughs> just goes out there <laughs> and gets a silver. Yeah. Right. But I mean, what's the, what's the stigma between those two? Right. Cause I, I don't think there's the same stigma about like external tech because people kind of like, you know, Oh Yeah they just kind of accept that as a part of the sport with the shooting, you know, archery, they all have their stuff and, you know, some other sports obviously, but like internal tech is like zero tolerance. I yes. mean, any like whiff of something, it's like you're banned for three years or something like that. So. No. And that's, that's part of it. And the same thing was like, there was a big deal of like, I think it was the 1924 Olympics. They compared a hundred, meter sprinter from that till now and then the techno technological changes in the sport from shoes to the surface they run on to like back in 1924 there were no starting blocks they put, took out a little shovel and dug holes for their feet mm. and but the difference in times in a hundred years was not that big even though we have had technological external advancements um I think it's something half a second or something like that. Right. No. Yeah. I think if something has a huge impact, remember like there was a controversy over slap skates, like they were Mm -hmm. ridiculous, the leverage or whatever that the, the speed skaters were getting, they're like, okay, no more of that. Because I think it, it tips the scale so obviously sometimes. And again, I think they have committees that look at the internal stuff too. Like, is this enough? You know, like it's it's not just a, a drug, but it could be a metabolite of the drug or a ratio to another drug. You know how they were doing yeah. like the test to epi test ratio and and all that kind of stuff. I mean, they're having to get more and more sophisticated. And I guess, yeah, they do have committees, but it does sound to me or it feels like what Jarrell said, that the tiniest wisp, that nanogram or picogram, mm-hmm. you know, levels is that enough to have had any freaking impact on this guy's training? That's the real question you would think because if he accidentally exposes you know like i said you eat some meat from china or mexico and it's got a little bit of clenbuterol in it i mean i'm little <laughs> yeah. tiny wisp yes. three months ago you know does that mean that you're jacked or you're fast mm-hmm. no it, i really don't think it does and yeah. again even if they have committees to do it but it's a good point about there are different kinds of ergogenic aids they're not all biochemical mm-hmm. ergogenic aids uh, there's actually university classes on that kind of stuff. I yeah, have. I mean, and that's like, take the cycling example, which like we've we've known for a long time that cycling is one of the dirtiest sports there is. Like, it is much more frowned upon to me personally. Like, recently they've been catching people with like little electric motors built into their frames and shit. Like, that is yeah. way more. Wow. That is ask about way, that. Yeah. way more uh, of an offense to me than it is to take a PED because at least with that, like you still have to do the fucking work. You know? <laughs> yeah. They're... You still have to go do the training. Like you can't just take, uh, I don't care what you're taking. It's not just going to make you better without putting in the work. Whereas if I add a little motor on there that adds, they found motors and it's their own. They're not doing that much like, Oh, it adds 20 pounds or something. So it doesn't just run the bike for you like a motorcycle, but it takes some of that load off you which over hours of the tour de France or something, that's huge. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. think I don't remember that story. Cause that story was like on, I mean, it was on like 60 minutes or something mm-hmm. where they're talking about the, they're building it into the bike frames. And then, and I don't remember the outrage being this, like no Lance Armstrong outrage was like wild, right? Like it was, I mean, people were like, everyone had an opinion about the Lance Armstrong stuff. <sighs> And none of them watched any bike racing. Like, 
Yeah. God, like that whole thing was strange to me. Mm-hmm. But they had that story, and I thought that was way wild. Like that's way wilder. Yes. And that's like you know, not that there'd be a way to do it, but it's like, I guess maybe with the squat suits. But everyone competes with the same squat suits, so it like didn't matter. Yeah. But let's say you found a way to like get like a secret nanotech suit in your raw singlet that pretty much made you like a crane and like that would be way worse than if you you know just did any peds to me yep and so i don't understand why the public outrage leans so heavily against like you know peds but tech does not like technology does not get the same i would say they don't get the same you know flack that steroids and biological agents do the gen pop still has it's like over the armstrong thing they were literally shocked oh my god he's doing like (laughs) most fucking athletes are you know and that the gen pop doesn't get that it's like most professional athletes are gonna do whatever it takes to to excel at what they do and the gen pop just does not get that and they're shocked like oh my god i can't believe he's using drugs oh yeah him and everybody else you know he just got caught and he didn't really get caught is the thing he passed all his tests. It was, it yeah. was through word of mouth and stuff. Right. So my first thought about Jarrell's question there about, you know, why are they so shocked about the drugs? Because I think the gen pop assumes that drug, dirty, doping, mm. unhealthy, dangerous, and if it's mechanical and everybody can use it, they don't feel pressure to take something toxic that will hurt them. You know, Phil, you often point to that study years and years ago about how athletes would be willing to take stuff that would kill them flat out in like five or 10 years if they could get Mm -hmm. a gold. I think that's it. The gen pop thinks that drugs are super dangerous and bad. I've done deep dives on clenbuterol, for example. People don't understand what that drug is. Or, you know, they even think creatine is a steroid, for God's Mm -hmm. sake. And Or steroids in general. As a class of drugs, there are way scarier things in my opinion yeah. than yeah. a lot of these just you know some of the basic androgens that strength athletes have used over the years so i think that's why people are in such um, up in arms about stuff like don't get me wrong the epo thing and the blood doping yeah that's scary man yeah. nobody wants to have toothpaste consistency blood that your yeah. heart just can't pump and you die but at the same time I, I don't know. The, the pop, population, the gen pop, just thinks it's very scary and dangerous and even mm-hmm. lethal. And whereas something like a little bit of tech, they don't. No, and I, I mean, you're right. And it reminds me of like people's fright and misconception over that stuff is a lot like the old freaking movie, like Reefer Madness. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Kids going to go to be devil worshippers and. You know, <laughs> And it's, yeah. like, it's this misconstrued misinformation, but, and like I'm saying, I don't, I still think we need to have an Olympics that is, is tested, but give us another one and let's see which one pans out. I can almost guarantee you that's the other thing after, after so much human history, especially at the Olympic level and doing the same thing, the same contested events for hundreds of years. Like the natural human advancement is going to be limited at some point. You're going to have to allow it because people don't want to see the same fucking records over and over again. Like they, they want to see new world records broken and uh, the human machine as it naturally is built has a limit. You know, you're going to run out of records and it's going to be 40 years between records. And then it's beaten by like a half a kilo. Whereas, you know, right. Maybe this one. Hey, look! Oh my God! There's 20 kilos on that lift. You know. I think the problem with that is, in the long run, an escalation strategy leads to the, a sport collapsing under its own weight, like bodybuilding did. Yeah. Right? Like bigger, 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 harder, bigger, harder, and then before you know it, people are like this quivering beanbag chair. They can't even pull off a single pose. They flex on stage and they yeah. cramp up, and three people have to drag off their livestock sized carcass <laughs> you know yeah but that's not going to happen in sport you still have to be like you can't run 100 meters if you're just right. cramping up yeah <laughs> yeah so i mean yeah now, the full vaulting bar is 10 feet higher for some weird yeah. reason yeah that wouldn't be quite the same thing i guess that's true 
Yeah, but but I mean, then that's where it comes into the case where, like, at least my limited understanding of the I don't remember what the games are called that's coming up where they're testing them. It's like they're they're not testing them for stuff; they're testing them for health parameters. That seems logical to me. Yeah, like, it seems to be the point. You know, right? It's like, like they're 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 testing them for like, make sure your blood pressure's good, make sure your liver enzymes are good, make sure all that. Okay, you're a healthy athlete. Let's do this. You know, yeah. and at least they give them the warning. It's like, hey, bud, you know, you might want to adjust what you're doing. Your liver's pissed. You know, <laughs> <laughs> things like that. That seems logical to me. I mean, because anybody that's dealt with, I've been lucky enough to deal with really high level athletes, and yeah, a lot of them are going to do what it takes to win. Uh-huh. Um, and they're going to keep doing it despite what the public thinks. I mean, it kind of reminds me of the old UFC testing protocols where it's like, and I think people are still kind of clamoring to get those back, but w- where you had, I think it was just a threshold of testosterone. Like it was just like a max threshold of testosterone. I was just like across the board, right? Mm-hmm. Like, so, and you just, and it really was just like, by the time you got to the, the test, it wasn't like out of competition testing, which I think, you know, ruins it to some degree. But you saw a lot of guys like disappear, you know? Yeah. From that. Whereas, do you want the star power of kind of the guys who are juiced up a little bit? Or, because for the UFC, I didn't understand what the, what the, the reach was to be more clean than it was. I thought it was, growing in popularity just fine at mm-hmm. that time there's one guy I, re- I remember like overeem who looked like a freaking monster right like you know you know he's like six two and huge like 230 240 lean you know whatever and those are some and he didn't win like every fight you know you had like you know brock lesnar and those kind of guys in there as well and i, I kind of got the impression that you know the popularity of that sport wasn't like there wasn't a ton of external pressure mm-hmm. from like the crowd i should say i don't know if maybe there's a chance to get sued or something for not testing i don't know but then they switched to the usada testing you saw a lot of star guys like really star power guys disappear mm-hmm. and then part of it's just because the training for mixed martial arts these days kind of reminds me of like how CrossFit training has tra- changed where it's like multiple times a day you have like pretty much your training hours, like on the mat training hours or lifting hours is like in the 20 per 20 hour per week range. And it's like, if you're going to be training like that, it's like, I mean, maybe something, it'd be nice to have something, right? Yeah. You know, more than a protein shake and creatine. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you, we're halfway through, so let's let's go ahead and take a break. We'll come back. We'll just talk some more Olympics. Good. Hey, everybody. Iron Radio is back and in an expanded way. What can you expect? Well, first, you can get it simulcast every week on the nutritionradio.org network as well as on the original podcast. It'll appear regularly on iTunes, Spotify, and all your favorite podcasting sites. We have a new Iron Radio slash Nutrition Radio Facebook page as well. Please check us out. We're even backed up on YouTube. We hope that an expanded presence will get you the news, education, banter, and guests that's made Iron Radio's community so loyal from the start. You are appreciated. Okay, guys, we're back. Like Lonnie said, we're just going to talk more Olympics, and I think, uh, you know, number one is just what's going on. And the biggest one for me, of course, being somebody that's interested in pure strength and things like that, is uh, we actually got a couple medals in Olympic weightlifting. So, um, and a gold, and it, I think, is this the first gold for women's weightlifting in the history of us or was there no, uh, in 2000, so the first okay. year of Olympics, uh, Tara not got a gold medal, but since then, yeah. So, yeah. So first time in 20, 20 years and, uh, Olivia Reeves, which she came on the scene this is their first Olympics. And, uh, well, she came on the scene pretty hard at the last world championship, right? Was her first big, well, I mean, as far as in the senior category, she had been doing stuff in youth. So, but she came up as her first, first Olympics. And 
not only got a gold, but set a new Olympic record. So it's fun to see. It's fun to see the U S team, uh, actually competing at that level. But, and then who was that guy? Time. For our last topic, snitching works, guys. Like you <laughs> just <laughs> it's on everyone else who's using drugs. I mean, it's easy. Yeah. Uh, Hampton Morris is the guy. He got bronze, and he's in the. It's not the. I think it's sixty-two. This is like it's a super light weight class. Bronze medal weight class, yeah. which is the first since like I don't know. It's like the seventies or something like that it's for men. Or no, it's not. It would be the 90s, so 30 years. Yeah. Yeah, other than that, I mean, it's just one thing that interests me is looking at the medal count, which I haven't today. I'm still not understanding. Like, why is it do you guys think that we just dominate the medal count so much? Because there's other countries like China that have more people than we do. So it can't just be our size. I understand most nations. Like a lot of Europe, their countries are the size of one of our states, maybe one of our smaller states. That makes sense. But you get into some of these bigger countries, and China's a good one in my mind to, because they have like government sponsored lifting, like where you're chosen. They have like, like their whole world revolves around these sports in a lot of ways. And like we don't have it at that level. We don't like take all our five-year-olds and like put them through tests and figure out you're going to be a weightlifter, you know? Uh, so it's kind of self-chosen who goes into the sports in our country, but like looking at the medals right now, we have 113 total medals. Number two has 84. Like we're <laughs> crushing it, but, uh, <laughs> I don't know. What do you guys think feeds into that? I mean, what do you mm. think that is the biggest reason? Beside, but th- behind that, I mean, of course, size. Like I said, that's a big, a good argument against place like Japan. Japan's a freaking island. Island to us. Yeah, you know, it's a small island. So of course, when we have a billion people, we're gonna have better athletes. But in general, and there's lots of athletes that come to America to be better athletes, even though they still uh, compete for their country. I mean, this is gonna be. Hopefully not too kind. It's really kind of genetic diversity, right? Like you have and people who, you know, over the last, you know, how many hundreds of years, I mean, hundred years essentially, like immigrated here and train here full time. So they bring their they bring the cultural background of like the sport. So one, this is just one example. I don't think we I don't think we got a medal in it, um, but our representative was her family like she's filipino her family's filipino she just happened to be born here born in the u.s raised here was badminton Mm -hmm. and so she's either competing badminton but like her you know mom and dad essentially filipino but they you know made a point to like come to the u.s right and so when you get like that kind of not only genetic diversity but also um just cultural diversity, like you have a like you have a much better map to find excellence than China is almost at a disadvantage because they're well I don't know that their genetic diversity is on the you know lower necessarily and not to because China's like up in the top three of you know medal count as well mm-hmm. but they only care about very specific sports yeah I mean, like they they are very specific like. You know, obviously weightlifting, you know, uh, gymnastics would be one. I mm-hmm. think that like we, especially on the women's side, we beat them in, but their, their little, their policy about, you know, having uh, girl children might've hurt them there like over the last yeah. however many years. But I mean, you have like, look at the gymnastics team. That is a very genetically diverse group for the u.s most other countries don't have that advantage i mean it's hard to have a country where you can kind of pick and choose whatever sport and then there's a place here in the u.s to train for it at a very high level whereas 
you know, unless it's state sponsored in other countries, that's not the case. You just don't yep. have that opportunity. No, I guess even the genetic melting pot that we are is probably has a big factor into it too, as far as going further down the line. Like it's easy. And I'd say athletic people tend to be attracted to other athletic people and then they make babies, which makes athletic babies and, you yeah. know, which more so than other countries, uh, like even the diversity in, in relationships in our country compared to, you know, mixed race, uh, relationships and children and things like that compared to other countries is way high and so maybe yeah uh, it'd be interesting to see a study on that like it's a good argument i mean if we have last numbers i looked at like so let's say we have like 330 million people in this country and that's that might be a third or a quarter of what china has but yeah we're yeah, we're more diverse. I mean, think I'm a nutritionist, right? So one of the things I tell students in the classroom, this is kind of funny analogy, but is if I could boil all the nutrition down to one word, it would be variety, right? Because with variety, you get all the little things, dispersed things that you need, but you don't overdose on any one thing, right? It's like self-correcting. So it might be vitamins and minerals or phytochemicals, getting all the things you need from all the variety in the diet versus mm -hmm. not getting a contaminant, right? Something that's sort of a weakness or would make you sick. You could almost take that same approach almost to populations like yeah. this, right? They're so broad and var the variety principle really is important with this kind of stuff. Uh, so even though we might have a third or a quarter of China's population, yeah, I, yeah, it's a good point. I wonder how genetically diverse they are. I mean, God, you'd have to look at genetics studies and stuff. You know what I mean? Because I don't know enough about all the regions of China and all that kind of stuff. But yeah. uh, it's a good, it's a good thought for sure. Like maybe that's I mean, it. It's the, it's the diversity and the variety that we have here, because we are a melting pot. Yeah. I mean, I mean, genetic and cultural. Because I mean, I'll yeah. say this: so China has, so they're Jamaica got, they had a really track and field season which is the only thing they care about mm -hmm. i mean not not like obviously if other jamaicans are doing well but track and field is like their nfl like that's their football yeah, yeah. and they like they got beat they got beat out by china and like to even get into the four by one final mm -hmm. there's a chinese team that won or that you know got in there so it, in terms of the genetic diversity, I think there's like some capacity of like the genetic aspect. But in China, culturally, is like they come and find you for the sport, whereas we kind of can get whoever to compete and like do the sport initially, right? Like so, China, like when you're state sponsored, it's like they tell you what to care about. Like yeah, you care about <laughs> right. weightlifting. And I saw there was a video recently where they it was. Um, I forget who it is, but is just on Instagram. But they showed how they select Chinese weightlifters from these schools, right? And so they go to these poor areas and like they just, you know, essentially have like this little test where they do like broad jumps and all this stuff. And they look at their, you know, arms and they look at their squat position and they select from that, you know, off of that. But Honestly, after looking at that and seeing, because they have, you know, millions and millions of weightlifters in their system, not millions, millions yeah. but like a million in their weightlifting system. Yet without the drug aspect, they're not like, I mean, they're pretty dominant. Don't get me wrong, but they're not like totally dominant, dominant. Yeah. Right. And so it's one of those things where culturally they care about it, but it's not like people can kind of voluntarily participate. Yeah. Whereas with the badminton thing here, you know, it's like you also got that cultural diversity that, like, listen, badminton's one of the sports we've never won a medal in. And so when you have, like I said, that Filipino girl who's representing us and her, they culturally, they do care about that. I don't know what it is about badminton in, in Asian countries, but they fucking love that. <laughs> <laughs> But because like you look at who the finalists is like there's some little Nordic countries in there, but it's like Asian like that and ping pong, right? Yeah, no, there's that's what I was like gonna the, say. They put up a pink a picture countries. of the American ping pong team, and it was all Asians. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But, so you get you get aspect of that cultural diversity as well. Like they 
So you bring in people, like essentially people are coming here for whatever you know, opportunity, generally economic or a lot of times economic. But then you all, they bring with them like, like, oh, no one cares about this, but pre them. Now all of a sudden, you know, you have people who are training for, you know, bad men. Nah, Whereas that makes, was not necessarily the case before. It makes me wonder how much, like you look at the state sponsored countries. So you have a bunch of athletes that they're essentially a bit ahead because they've been doing it so long. But like the athletes here doing it, like generally any Olympic athlete that I've met, like they're doing it because they love the sport. So they have a true love because you're not going to be famous. You're not going to be rich by being an Olympian in general. So you're doing it purely for the love of the sport. Whereas in those countries, you're doing it because you have to, which can like, don't get me wrong. That can be a big incentive to like, um, you know, my life's made if I do this, but at the same time, if you have a group of athletes that's truly passionate for the sport, like they'll do anything because they love it. <laughs> you know, there has to be some, that has to be some aspect of it. Like our people that are good at track and field just love it because it's track and field and that's what they love on these force programs that like, fuck, I don't want to do this, but I have to just that mental side has to be, you know, one thing I was thinking about, cause it's a good point about cultural diversity, of course. And even the like sociopolitical stuff, like we were, we're talking about like China and s selecting people who are going to be great because of their body proportions or their lineage or whatever. Uh, here in the States though, because of capitalism, we talked about this before too. A lot of gifted athletes might drift away from, you know, like Olympic weightlifting. And if they're, you know, like uh, I think we had Marty Gallagher talking about big man sports, you know, they're going to go for sp sports where the money is. I mean, because yes. we're, we're a capitalistic society here in the U S. So even though we have a big population, not as big as China, but big, some of that mm -hmm. does get bled off into like the big three sports, right? For a lot of stuff. Yes. And I, I know some of those are also Olympic sports. I, I get it. But at the same time, yeah, um, we're not self-selecting. And like you guys were saying, I think it's kind of funny, like trying to, you're told what you're going to be. Mm -hmm. Hey, guess what? You're six years old. We're telling you you're going to do this. Go to this dormitory and live here or whatever. I know this is really yeah. like completely uh, <laughs> stereotyping it, I suppose, but. As opposed to no, here, I mean, here, yeah. If you're a big, strong kid, you might like, well, hell with Olympic weightlifting. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to get, get into college ball and then a shot at the pros. Yeah, and, you yeah. know, in football. Yeah. Uh, so there's that's a bleed off for us because we are, you know, sort of capitalistic like that and money driven. Yeah. So yeah. I, I almost and and just thinking about and obviously for weightlifting it's probably fine. But it's almost an argument against that like selection process because there's i mean there's more that goes into like being an excellent athlete than mm -hmm. just selecting the right you know and i used to think it was kind of cool with like the russian stuff and like oh the russians picked the perfect lifter and this and that but and actually something that stands out especially with the chinese system is so lu jiaojun you know when i went to his i went to this little seminar with him and his coaching team in Lao Hue or whatever. And they wanted, you know, they got both of them initially got selected from this like process. Right. But both of them, like the Chinese weightlifting federation was ready to, you know, essentially fire them or whatever until coach you came along and was like, no, I see, you know, whatever potential, like we're going to, you're going to train with me specifically. It's like that selection process doesn't always win. Right. Mm -hmm. Like it doesn't. And Lu Zhaozun, who I mean, he's probably on the Mount Rushmore, I'd say, of weightlifting. One, someone who has like a ton of world championships and then multiple gold medals. I think kind of the litmus test for like on the Mount Rushmore is essentially like three Olympic gold medals. And you got three Olympic golds. You're pretty much that's like goaded in weightlifting. Yeah. Like Twelve years of dominance, basically. It's like that selection process, they were ready to move on from him. And yeah. so some of it, there's like an impatience with that process. And there's a lot that you discount when you just start looking at whatever features that someone has that I think maybe because Olivia Reeves 
probably wouldn't have gotten selected, right? Like she's like mm-hmm. very strong. She's one of the like as she came up, she's I mean she's I remember the videos I saw of her. She was back squatting like 190 kilos back you know when she was like 15. Yeah, and and so it's kind of like I saw those videos before anything else. And but you look at her arm length, like her limb lengths are not weightless, weightlifter esque. She's got very yeah. kind of long arms. She's kind of like long and lanky, yet is a gold medalist amongst countries that do care about gold medals and weightlifting. Yeah. So uh, that selection process might not be the greatest. And I wonder if China will look into that after the like gymnastics, right? Like mm-hmm. they keep getting beat by the women's gymnastics here with stronger, powerful athletes. I wonder if they'll actually revamp whatever they're doing. Yeah. No, that's interesting. I mean, it's it's especially all the different sports and what it takes to be a champion. Then you get the outliers that just in their body that end up making it despite not being the so-called perfect perfect build. But, huh, well, we can call it. Yeah. So. No good I stuff. Gotta, I get to go get pads for youth football mm-hmm. so alright guys well until next week I hope you guys enjoyed the show and thanks for joining us thanks everybody Iron Radio is accepting donations if you like what we do the professors the scientists the bodybuilding show promoters the athletes themselves in powerlifting and bodybuilding um Please consider making a donation or maybe buying something from the ironradio.org store. Uh, We also are accepting supporting members. So for $4 a month, which is frankly less than the bank sneaks out of your account in fees, you can step up and support a form of sort of public radio for the bodybuilding and powerlifting and strength community. The Iron Radio Podcast and all of the audio on ironradio.org is for informational purposes only. If you're interested in starting a diet or exercise program, it's important to check with your physician. Also seek the help of registered dietitians, athletic trainers, and qualified exercise physiologists in order to make the progress that you need.